Hey friend Well I don't know where I'm going I hope you go far In the final opening shot ever, we see Tyrion rethinking his life choices. What used to be a fun city with Sunday afternoon beheadings and a bustling red light district is now fucked. John A says, Oi, Wormsy, quit killing dickheads. You won, buddy. He's like, what are you, an SJW? Are you triggered? It's clear Wormsy has been radicalised and it's best to leave him alone. Will a finger on Jamie's golden hand move? I'm pretty sure George wrote a prophecy about this. The golden hand prophecy? Nah, nah, he's dead as fuck. Tyrion performs CPR. It's way too late though. There's Wormsy again. WTF, how'd you beat me here? I must be out of shape. Danny and Drogon thought it would be cool to make it look like she has wings for a split second. Yeah, there's nothing sinister or depressing or dodgy about this atmosphere. I wonder whose job it is to carry around that big flag. She yells about draining the swamp and making the Seven Kingdoms great again. Tyrion is like, you know what? How about you take this job and stick it up your ass? This gets him arrested. Arya asks Jono if he's still pussy whipped. His face is indicating that it's possible. It's possible. Jono then wants to know why Tyrion quit his job. He says, it was a shithouse gig. Targaryen Industries never paid anyone. I don't know if you noticed that. I should have noticed given I pay my debts. Preaching about morals yet not providing salaries is the worst. Jono gets defensive about it. Outside, Drogon has been practicing his camouflage tactics. Jon has to sign the guest book before he's allowed to see the Queen. Danny is looking at her new office chair. She touches it and goes gets an electric shock but doesn't even flinch because she's a psycho! She gives John a sales pitch about making a better world. Oh no, he's bored into it. It's like seeing a friend on Facebook join a multi-level marketing scheme. Oh, wait a sec. No. Now he stabbed her in the heart. It's all good. Drogon gets fired up and says there'll be no chair for anyone from this point forward. Children can be astute in regard to knowing what wrecks their family. In this case, a fancy chair. Drogon lets his cousin live and fucks off with his mum to have a private funeral. Tyrion's beard has grown by two to three weeks. All the cool people have gathered to discuss what to do now there's no fancy chair. Wormsy tries to act like a cool person with power. Santa says, get fucked mate, you don't know what you're doing. You're a directionless baby killing scumbag. Give John and Tyrion back and fuck off. Everyone's thinking, whoa, she roasted him like Danny roasted the city. Eventually, because he's new at the game, he gets confused and tricked into accepting a shit deal. Brano gets chosen to be king because of his PhD in history. Tyrion will be his hand. He argues about it, but totally gives in to the soul-crushing stare. And Sansa gets her way with Winterfell doing a Brexit. Fuck yes, Brano. Fuck yes, mate. Jono's beard has grown by an additional week. Tyrion tells him he has to join the Night's Watch. He says there's no Night's Watch. Tyrion replies, Wormsy doesn't understand that. We tricked him. Just head north and bloody pretend. Oh no, not the Night's Watch. Please don't make me go there. What if I see my best friend and my dog again and meet a new wildling, Sheila? My life is ruined. Finally, the Stark kids have a catch up before going separate ways. Brienne writes about Jamie in the Kingsguard book. For example, the sister fucker popped my cherry and tried to leave before Brecky. King Brano addresses the new lords of small matters and there it is, Ghost gets a pat. Pat confirmed, he's a good boy. I reckon let's roll the credits on the pat just for fun, let's fucking do it. Just a quick one, Soul Crushing Stare has been put on a t-shirt as requested. It's available for purchase at teespring.com slash soulcrushingstare. The link is in the post description below or the top comment. Buying it helps my channel big time. If you use the code AussieMan at the checkout, you'll get 10% off. In fact, if you use that code on any of the shirts in my Teespring store, you'll get the sweet fucking discount. That's all, cheers.
Nah, fuck it. Fuck you. I'm happy. Nah, look, I'm not oblivious to elements of season 8 that could be better, or done differently at least, but let me go over what I liked in this episode, as I've done for years, and what I reckon it's about. And then we can dig deeper and analyse and argue on a broader scale. My favourite scene this week was Drogon destroying the bloody chair. It's the greatest display of personality we've seen in a dragon, and I think it's fucking mint. Considering that revenge was so prominent in the last episode, and in fact revenge has been a prominent theme for a decade in the series, it's awesome to see a creature be like, screw this! Stop murdering people and each other over power and the shit that gets taken from you. Just fair dinkum, stop it. So Drogon is player of the week. He no longer wants to be used as a weapon of mass destruction. Good on him. I reckon Peter Dinklage had a lot of juicy moments in this episode. We know he's an A-grade actor when it comes to dialogue-driven scenes. And I like that he and Jono had a two-hander that was eight minutes long. In a way, these are the types of scenes we've been saying we miss from season seven and, and eight with the shorter quantity of episodes. There's an aspect of the writing that's like a play. It's theatrical. It's dense and blunt and on the nose as the pros say, but it's enjoyable seeing the actors get to deliver it. I love the eeriness in the opening 10 minutes of the episode. I was excited to see Daenerys portrayed in a villainous way. The contradictions in the state of mind of the character is interesting and engaging. Edmure Tully's cameo was fucking hilarious. Sansa is queen in the north I like. Arya being Ragnar Lothbrook is brilliant. And King Brano is a safe and stable decision, I feel. There's something nice about the Starks and the Lannisters working together in the highest office after so many seasons of the Lion and the Wolf being at each other's throats. Jono taking the black again is fitting too. The new small council warms my heart. The final episode is called The Iron Throne and I reckon it's about building a better world through what you are good at as an individual, not through someone overseeing it all or telling large populations what to do. Most of our final characters settle down into a position that reflects what they're best at and hopefully this builds a better world. It's also about change being very slow and people trying to figure out how they can stop going round and round in destructive circles. It's a big message, it's a powerful message, I like it. Let's talk about the writing, which is the filmmaking department that's had the most criticism this year. There's been a dickload of discussion about character arcs in this season. I've never seen a fan base use the word arc so many bloody times. I think the writing has always pushed beyond conventional rules and terminology you read in Save the Cat or Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. There's frustration in feeling like a character has stagnated or gone backwards or made the same mistakes or done the opposite to what you'd expect. Fuck me, I've chucked tantrums like other fans over character arcs. But there's also something daring in keeping your characters malleable and contradictory. Maybe I've come to like it or I respect the risk because the reward can be a deeper exploration of humanity. The actors get a chance to work with a fucking spectrum of emotional layers rather than a concrete trajectory of linear growth. I don't want to just make assumptions that Daniel Weiss and David Benioff don't care or they got lazy. I'm in no position to comment on their professional acumen or there's no evidence I've seen of that mindset being the case, I feel it's possible the writing has tried to be mainstream and neat and tidy and satisfying, yet keep an edge to it that's that's not conventional. And if that's the intent, I respect the risk and I respect the challenge. I have felt like there's missed opportunities with characters, they've been underutilised at times, but then maybe it's borderline impossible for the spotlight to be shared more than it was. Having 10 episodes in season 7 and 8 is a fun thought. 
I do think there's credibility in that criticism. The flip side to it though, is that maybe there'd be complaints about the middle episodes being filler. Look, I, I like that the show didn't turn into 20 episodes per season to exploit the fan base and go on forever. I think there's a saying in show business, or maybe I've just had one mate say this to me, if you're doing great or you're doing shit, it's never too early to get off stage. The show absolutely gets more respect from me for not dragging on purely because it has top-notch ratings. Episode 5 keeps sticking in my head. When you think about it, Danny becoming a mad queen would not be an easy decision to commit to. We're seeing heroically portrayed female characters being flawless and staying flawless at the moment in our pop culture. Okay, except Jessica Jones to be fair, she's flawed as fuck and it's awesome. So regardless of whether or not that particular arc was rushed or too subtle, it's a confronting trajectory no matter what. It's like Tom O'Jane killing his son and trying to suicide at the end of The Mist in 2007. It may not matter how you get there, it's a shock. I think episode 5 was a very uncomfortable episode, and because of this I also think it's going to be an episode that will age the best out of season 8. Episodes 2 and 5 were hands down me favourites. Fuck, well we're at it, uh, and if you've stuck around this long, my all-time favourite scene is Jamie and Brienne in the hot tub. My all-time favourite season is season 4. Maybe I have an emotional attachment to that season because I started making my reviews and my remixes during that time and HBO decided to release automated copyright claims on what I was doing and essentially helped spawn a career for me to be honest. And I discovered the Game of Thrones subreddit during season Season 4 when I was living alone, I have loved spending time in there. At the risk of sounding like a mushy soft cock, Game of Thrones changed my life. I feel like I may not be the only dickhead to say the show has impacted them beyond being just a piece of entertainment. Perhaps that's the most powerful theme of Game of Thrones, its ability to bring people together. It's a family show. You know, I've been able to talk about it with my uncle at Christmas. It's weird. It's managed to get introverts out of the house and watching it in pubs or going out to nightclubs because Hodor is a fucking DJ. Geeky introverts don't go to nightclubs, but they bloody well will for Hodor. I'm sure it's helped people fit in within the workplace. I've seen GOT themed weddings. There's livelihoods created like mine because the fan communities have been allowed to breathe. There's an insane amount of creativity it has sparked in people. It's just crazy when you realise there's a real world impact from art and entertainment. Not all art and entertainment, but every once in a while some of it cuts through to resonate with people and get their brains firing. I think the last decade with Game of Thrones has been one of those cases. So it forever remains a high distinction from me. And the exciting thing is, we still have two books to come from George. The show has kind of told us how those books will pan out, but I'm still excited for them. Okay, that's me done, and now my watch has ended. It had to be said. I don't care how many YouTube reviewers are gonna say it. It had to be said.